Hi, hey, hello everyone, and thanks for joining Colorado LTAP for another workshop Wednesday series. Today we're going to be talking about drone usage with public works. And today we have Gary Walter, a uh, senior engineer from Douglas County, who's joining us. And with that, I will pass things off to Gary to talk a little bit about drone usage. Hello. Um, we have a little video here just to kind of start and let everybody sort of see some of the things you can do. Uh, with drones. Uh, it's a fascinating world. There's a lot of things that go on here. This happens to be just a tree that cut down. This is very, very short, uh, but it's interesting. You can see uh, how versatile this is. We looked at this after the fact and discovered we were able to see what our traffic control guys were doing. Uh, we could see what the safety things were for the people who cut down the tree. We were able to watch a lot of things. On top of that, it was sort of an interesting video. Um, so this is always an option with drones. You can do slideshows, uh, just still pictures. You can do videos like this one. You can add music. Um, we don't do a lot of videos because they take a lot of memory. Uh, but our county commissioners love them in the public sector. Uh, they're able to see what's going on and, and uh, show the public and it's something that uh, tells the story fairly well. So at any rate, um, well, let me stop right here too. At the top of that video, uh, we just a little bit of information. You'll see this again at the end. Should you have questions or want to contact me with uh, whatever you want to contact me with, uh, there's a phone number there drone at gmail.com. You're welcome to send questions and whatnot at your will. Uh, so what can a drone do? Uh, it has, first of all, a camera, which does the still and the video photography you just saw. Those come out in JPEG, uh, MP3 or MP4, and RAW. And if you don't know what RAW means, RAW means that these are pictures that uh, have never been adjusted by the camera so that you can adjust them yourself. Uh, to get better color, better whatever. And it's done especially if you want to create um, models or pictures, big pictures and posters on the wall, and you want to do something really special. You'll see some of that in this presentation. You can also put sensors on them, LIDAR sensors, which are light detection and ranging. They're good for high resolution maps and 3D models. Multispectral sensors, they collect the wavelengths that are reflected from our environment. Those are really very, very cool. What happens is the light shines out of, say, a leaf on a corn plant. Um, and, and we know what that light should look like. There are many spectrums of light above and below what our eyes can see. And the drone picks up all those other things. And from that, they can tell if this plant is low on some kind of mineral or if it's extra wet or extra dry. Uh, what's going on, if the soil's alkaline, they can determine a lot of stuff from multispectral images uh, that are taken with multispectral uh, sensors. Then you have the thermal sensors, which are uh, used primarily in search and rescue because they can see the warm body. Even at dark, it shows up red and orange, and, and you can see warm things. And, but they use them also now in uh, firefighting especially big forest fires. They can't fight fires at night. So during the, during the night when they can't fire, you know, or, or, or fight fire, they don't know where the fire has moved. So early in the morning, what they do is put the drone up. The thermal sensors can show them where the hot spots are, and they can then determine how to attack that fire, how to uh, send people, where to send people, what to do uh, with them. So, and they help you see what's on the ground. Uh, they're really, really useful for, for like finding existing features, landforms, vegetation, fence lines, erosion space. Depends on what you're interested in, what you want to do. And I've learned that they are really only limited by um, the imagination. I have been asked, the, I never expected this one, I have been asked to fly as high as I can fly and do a 360 degree video because. Uh, the people in charge wanted to see what could be seen from that place because it happened to be the place where a fireworks show was going to go off. And they wanted to see 
who could see. And so that takes us into the land planning stuff. You know, you can look around and see, well, what can I see and what is useful? And this kind of stuff here, if you look out there, you can see where there's houses, you can see where there's valleys, where there's roads, where there's grading. Uh, when you're doing planning, you want to know all these things and where the vegetation is and, and what you should do. And of course, you can get this much more detailed than just a simple picture like this one. In addition to that, uh, you can create flight paths, which are really very, very cool. Uh, you can create a path that flies like over a fence line so that you can check fences today and you can check them again next month, the next month, the next, and the drone will fly exactly the same pattern, look at the same things, show you the same stuff over and over. Or you can create what we call a lawnmower pattern. Uh, the drone will fly uh, clear to the end of the polygon that you outlined for it, and then it'll turn around and come back and then turn around and go back and it'll fly back and forth like a lawnmower. It's taking pictures every 10 or 15 feet at the end of all that you feed that into your computer and it will create a model a 3d model uh, that you can use this is the picture or an example of the pictures that it takes you can see how uh, they're kind of in sequence but the drone is moving taking pictures and later it will stitch all of that together into a 3d model once you have a 3d model of the ground uh, you can see a lot, you can turn it, twist it, look at it. But more than that, once it's done and you've moved on a week or two or a month and the ground has changed because you've graded or you've built something, you can fly it again. The drone will fly the same pattern, take the same pictures, but they're gonna be different than the first time. So that now it will compare, the computer can compare that and it will give you uh, volumes, volumes of dirt moved, cut, or fill. It, it'll tell you, here's what you got. Next four pictures, uh, don't, I don't tell you a whole lot, but the example is uh, we put up a big concrete batch plant that was uh, very sensitive to the people around. And so they wanted to know what did it look like at 25 feet. So you fly the drone up at 25 feet, you see this. 50 feet, it looked like that. 75 looked like that. And 100 looked like that. You really couldn't tell a lot in these particular pictures, but that kind of stuff is very helpful to know uh, who, who can look and see what kinds of things you're looking at. We also do a lot of events that we record. Here is an equipment rodeo we did. This particular picture, for what it's worth, uh, two months ago was on the front cover of Public Works Journal, Colorado Public Works Journal. Um, it shows the event as it was going on, and we do several things like that. The next one is, here's a, an event in Parker, Colorado at the Echo Stadium. Uh, it was a electronics recycle event. Uh, notice on the right side, that's Chambers Road and all the cars that are lined up. Uh, and going off the screen, they were lined up for miles and miles and miles uh, waiting to get into here. This was a little better scene of just the space where they were collecting all of those uh, things to be recycled. Facilities are another thing that we look at a lot. Uh, when we're looking at facilities, uh, it's a matter of wanting to see, you know, what's things, what's happening in our yard, what's going on. You see salt, salt sand barns up to the left. We can see what they look like. Uh, generally, this was an off time. It's not very used at this point in time. But you are able to look at them from any direction, anywhere, anytime you want to. Salt sand barns are full. Mag chloride tanks to the right. All looks well. Here's a new a, a, a loading dock that was constructed. Uh, again, the public wanted to see it. So it was flown, and these pictures were taken, made available for the public buildings in process. You know, this one's been shot many times. This is just one of many uh, during a several month period to identify what was going on. This is another area where a lot of questions from has been asked uh, on this facility. This is the Douglas County EVOC, Emergency Vehicle Operations Center. The police from a lot of jurisdictions on the front range come here. They do high speed chases, fire people, Fire departments come out here and 
practice turning their trucks and driving fast and doing whatever they do, uh, but it is a practice center for emergency vehicle operations. We look at parks. Um, some of these pictures, like this is one of them that was shot in the raw, like I mentioned before, and they enhanced the pictures so that they could actually make wall posters out of them and, and show what does the parks look like. Um, and, you know, and then they point to it and say, well, use this facility, use that one over there, use this one over here. Um, that, that's been very popular stuff. Excuse me. And then even looking down at a baseball diamond, you, you get a lot of opportunity to look and see uh, what's on the ground. This was a very interesting picture. It was done because of turf management. And you can see what you can't see on the ground. You can see where the sprinkler heads are. You can see where the weak watering is and where the heavy watering is. Uh, they knew they had problems. And from the air, you could see what was wet and what was dry and where the sprinklers are. It gave them a big clue about what to do next and how to fix their problems. Emergency services um, use the drones a lot as well. Uh, the police use them for traffic accidents. They take and fly drones now, and it measures the skid marks, and it measures where the cars landed. And it measures everything they've landed so they don't have to get out there and measure things on the ground anymore. They also do the aerial search and reconnaissance. In the, the firefighting, I think I mentioned some of this already, with the hot spots and the daily logistics, they can see the topography. They can see where vegetations are, where houses and re other resources are that they need to protect. Emergency management comes in a little later when we have things like floods or windstorms or snow, rain, and hail. Uh, you can fly the drone and inspect the damages to understand what you need to do, how big your problem is, what kind of damage was done. But even more than that, the information you collect, the pictures you get, will help you with FEMA documentation for uh, later FEMA payments. And then search and rescue, of course, is big, really big. Uh, in the mountains of Colorado, that's used a lot to the point where I recently saw how they did a search and rescue uh, looking for somebody, couldn't find them because of the vegetation, the heavy trees. And they asked the computer to take the pictures and look for something pink. And with that information alone, they found the pink on a tennis shoe and found the people they were looking for. That was really amazing. In construction, which is particular to public works operations. Um, we do a lot of stuff looking at projects that are in process. This one is in process right now. The bridge decks have not even been put on yet, but they're, they're doing that work. So, you, you know, we look a lot at girders, uh, the placement of girders, the steel uh, uh, that goes into them. All that stuff is watched and recorded. We do it quite regularly uh, to see them. Paving projects, uh, are always recorded. We, uh, we see how the trucks are doing, where they're coming from, how they're doing, doing their job. Drainage projects, we can look and see what's going on. It even helps the guys in the field because they see it different than we see it uh, when we're just standing on the ground. When it comes to new projects, new roads, and the striping and signage, do we, we want to know that it's, it's there, that it's right, that it's... Uh, being effective. And so we will go up and take pictures of the, of the uh, new striping and signage that was placed. Here's one where we had a brand new roundabout and uh, we had a lot of people complaining. Uh, they didn't like this, they didn't like that. Uh, again, we were asked to fly this, get pictures of it so it could be analyzed to see well, what's the problem. Turned out there wasn't a problem except that people just weren't used to the roundabout and they didn't like it. Uh, but it was designed appropriately and is working and functioning properly. Uh, the drone helped us to collect the information and do a final analysis to see that all was well. Some miscellaneous things that you can do. The little fuzzy, fuzzed out part here is the Platte River. Uh, we needed to know one time about river bank erosion. Uh, we flew the drone sideways downriver for about six miles, taking pictures of the bank as the drone went sideways downstream, uh, analyzing 
and watching for places where we have uh, river erosion. We've had um, requests to uh, take staff photos. This particular one was uh, our parks people. They wanted to know if we could do this, and sure, it was not a problem. You can line this kind of thing up anytime, anywhere, and take pictures. We now have, this year, last year, recently, Douglas County has had a lot of sinkholes happening. This particular one uh, was like 30 feet deep. Um, we were asked to fly it to see what we could see down in the hole. We also took a lot of pictures way up high to see what we could discover about the alignment and where it was going and what caused it. Uh, we were able to figure all that out. Uh, but who would have ever thought that we would be flying down into a hole uh, that just sunk away uh, to try to figure out what was going on there? Why was it sinking? Here's another one of the Platte River, the riverbank erosion. Uh, that really did work well. And not only did it work well from seeing the points, uh, but we were able to go in with uh, uh, GPS, not GPS, but uh, uh, what am I thinking of? With, with the geospatial data, and we, we created a map that showed the location of each picture on a map so that when we had a problem or have a problem along the stretch of the river, we can look at the map, click on the picture on the map, and shows us what did it look like at this point in time, which was about three years ago, and compare it to the current point in time. So mapping all the points, and there was almost 500 of them that went down the river, uh, turned out to be a really wonderful thing because they're, they're mapped, and we can just click on the map and shows the pictures of that spot. So you need to be licensed in order to do all this with the FAA. Um, they also call it certified. Uh, so you need to be certified or licensed. Um, the United States requires that for everybody now. There was a time when uh, hobbyists could just go fly, just go fly a drone and, and fly. But now they have uh, created another level. It's called the trust certification. That certification goes for everybody who, does, who works as a hobbyist or, or just hobby pilots. And there's no charge for it, but it's a safety thing. They try to get everybody to do this so that they understand what they can and can't do and how they should stay away from uh, airports and what's safe, what's not safe, what's acceptable, what's not acceptable. But then you have the other step, which is what we do and what anybody like yourselves who need to do. If you're flying a drone for any government uh, the federal, state, or tribal agency, or or for profit for a company, you need to have the actual license or certification. And you can fly under the 14 CFR, which is a code of federal regulations, Part 107. You'll always hear people referring to Part 107. Uh, that is the most normal thing people do. They, they take the test, pass the test, they get certified, and then they can fly uh, for the government, or they can fly uh, commercially. Uh, and there are some rules. You see a little bit of it here. You can't go over 400 feet above ground level. You can't fly a drone that's over 55 pounds. Almost all the drones that we see or hear about today are only a couple pounds. So very, very small, very light, very efficient. So when you fly, um, the rules are you stay 400 feet above the ground, no higher than that. You always have to fly within line of sight. Uh, even though the drones will fly several miles from the pilot, uh, if you can't see it, you can't, you're not flying legal anymore. You have to be able to see your drone uh, at all times. You have to stay away from airports. It's typically five miles stay away from other aircraft. So if you're flying the drone and you see another aircraft that's coming in the vicinity, uh, you need to come down. Uh, you don't fly over people like uh, at a big event or a football game or anything like that because if the drone does go 
crazy or does something wrong, or even the pilot does something wrong, uh, people can get hurt. So they can get very, very much injured from the blades cutting and doing whatever they do. They'll fly close to sports events or stadiums. Um, and, and if there's an emergency situation like car crashes or fires, uh, it doesn't matter who you are. You don't fly drones near those. You don't fly under the influence of alcohol. And you got to be aware of controlled airspace, uh, which is near and around the airports. There's an app that you should use. It's called Before You Fly. It's very, very helpful. It will show you all of the conditions and things you should be watching for. And uh, things that uh, uh, might be dangerous or hazardous, or sometimes there's there's a like an air show or or something going on uh, that is not normal. The Before you fly, app will inform you of those things too. So you always check to know what's what's in the area, what's going on before you fly. So I went through that fairly quickly. If if there are any questions, please let me know. Again, there's the contact information. Uh, you, you're welcome to call me, uh, send me emails. I'd be happy to answer questions. Um, if you're interested in getting into the drone program, uh, a drone that does the, the kinds of things that I just showed you uh, can be purchased for anywhere from a thousand to two thousand dollars, which isn't terrible. Uh, to take the test and pass it, uh, the FAA charges one hundred and seventy-five dollars to take the test. After that, you need to be recertified every two years. That is no cost to recertify. Um, oh, there was another something I was going to mention here. There, there are bigger drones. Um, they're, they're very, very big, like uh, cost $250,000, that can take the pictures, uh, have all the sensors on them. They, they collect just about every kind of data you can imagine. They use those kinds of things on wind turbines, inspections, uh, uh, power line, power poles. They inspect with those to try it. And sometimes even bridges, uh, they'll inspect those with the, with the drones that can take a lot more uh, data. Uh, but for the simple stuff that we do, uh, it's not simple, but it's, it doesn't have any sensors. We're not using any sensors for this stuff. Um, they're, they're not very expensive, but I can share with you that I know the, uh, the pilots in Buena Vista, Colorado, use the same kind of drones that we use. So they just put the sensors on them. So even then, you don't have to get a very expensive drone uh, to do some of these really high-powered things like search and rescue or the police work. Uh, you just need to add droners or sensors to the drones, and they'll do the job. So with that, I don't have a lot more to say about it. Uh, I'm going to stop sharing this screen and uh, 